Our next guest won a state championship at Provo High School and played college basketball and baseball at Utah Valley and basketball at Fresno State. He finished the 1993-94 season with the Bulldogs record and assists with 233 and was second in the nation, hitting 50% of his three-point shots. In 2002, he was inducted into the Utah Valley Athletic Hall of Fame, currently the Deputy Athletic Director at BYU. It is our pleasure to welcome Brian Santiago to the Wise Guys. We've been trying to get you in here for about four months. Tonight is the night. Welcome. And, and hey, it, it, I got to call the games when he played even, right? And um, he when when I lived at the Whittingham's house, these guys lived right behind me. <laughs> and so his I, dad. That's a whole show right there, I have a feeling. Brian's dad used to kind of make sure, because Fred and Nancy had moved down to L.A., and it was just the boys. It was just Kyle and and Carrie and I. That and sounds then, like and a good Ky- idea. And then Kyle Morell, which that combo right there is not a good thing. And and uh, Brother Santiago is is a dear dear soul that I love very much for for kind of keeping us in line and making sure we went to church. And he got a little mad at Carrie and I one night when I think it was a twenty two where there was like a um, wood wall b- behind the pool between us and you and. We put targets up on the wall, and we were shooting the gun into the wall, and your dad came over and told us it wasn't a good idea. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds about right. <laughs> there was a lot that went on at that home that, uh, you know, uh, everybody's alive. Everybody's yeah, everybody alive. Everybody lived, and you want to know what? We all landed on our feet. Well, uh, Ky- Kyle Morrell's not alive. Yeah, that's true. Because, Kyle's because and, and Kyle, Kyle <laughs> ALS got Kyle. Our, yeah. our good friend, but I'm, I'm telling you, if it wasn't if it wasn't for the Santiago family, we we probably would have run amok a little more than we did. Yeah, it's nice to be here with you guys. Good to have uh, you here. Danny just left, but I wanted to ask you uh, in a free throw shooting contest to twenty, who wins, you or him? No question, me. To twenty, how many he, you get? He would tell you the same thing. Twenty. He'd tell you to he'd tell twenty. And well, I'm not so you know, sure. Here's the thing: he'd make twenty too. He 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 would make twenty also. If we. If we You'd have to go 20, into bonus time no, to beat him. It'd go to bonus. It'd take a while. Did you uh, see? Did you see Tyler the other night on his on the fundraising uh, thing? He, he missed he the missed. first, and he made fifteen straight. Yeah, but he would have lost. Yeah, because he he, lo- he missed, missed the first. first. <laughs> he couldn't settle in. Uh, if you're on the he first tee too. over at Riverside, who it's the longest drive? You or Danny? Oh, uh, it depends. Hey, I, <laughs> on the wind or no, what? No, it just depends. <laughs> it just depends on if he tees his ball up too close to the to the tee marker and hits the tee marker. He told us uh, that you are, uh, how should we say this, liberal with your scorekeeping. Yeah. No, we're, I, we were telling him, that he said that, we told him that Governor Herbert, when we play with him, gives us governor's pardons, we get shots over again. He goes, oh, Brian takes a governor's pardon anytime he wants, whether he's playing with the governor or not. <laughs> Just consider the source. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> consider the source. One thing about golf is, and I really believe this, it's one of the purest games on planet Earth. And yeah. and uh, I will always say it's one of the reasons I love it is because it's, it actually is a game of honor. It really And is. especially when you get into good competitive matches. And uh, I actually am someone that doesn't think there's any room for any any sort of out of bounds in golf. You, and there's you no teammate. Play. There's no, yeah, you, you can't blame yourself. anybody. You, you can't. Yourself. You check yourself. It's it's so competitive because of the handicap system. Yep. Yeah. It keeps everybody in it. You you play. It, it's the matches. We just had some of the most unbelievable matches. He, he, I don't know if he told you. We have an ongoing score. No, he didn't say that. We, we for years and years, we've played <laughs> so many. Now, there is some question on what the overall record is. Yeah. Uh, and we differ on opinion there, but uh, since he's been back in Utah, since he moved to Utah, for a, a minute or two, I had the I had the lead, the overall lead, the overall lead. I think he's now surpassed me by how, one. Or like two. how many games? How many matches oh, is this now? Is it in the hundreds it's, it's and hundreds? Be a hundred. That's awesome. But but it's just it's awesome, and people don't know this. Uh, but you said something at the end there that's the reality. This is one, Danny Ainge is one of the best human beings that you'll ever find. Yeah. And he invests in kids even today that it's unbelievable. I'll tell you two quick stories. People don't know when he was playing at BYU, uh, he and Steve Trumbo, I showed up to my first junior jazz practice and they introduced us to our coaches, Steve Trumbo and Danny Ainge. So, 
Ainge was my coach as a little kid, and no kind of took me and in. And they were volunteering, right? Oh, they just volu- they, he, they just come from practice, and it, you know the first thing we start playing a little bit. The first thing he pulls me over and he said, "Hey." Uh, every time you get the ball, I want you to shoot. <laughs> so <laughs> that's where it so started. That's where it started. <laughs> Field goal attempts. FGAs, baby. You saw that green he light just, from Danny he said, You just He called me Santa. Santa, when you get it, you <laughs> shoot it. You do not pass. You shoot it. And and then he took me in. You know, He would bring me in the locker room after games. That's great. Uh, and so we started a friendship when I was – you know, eight, nine wow. years old. And that's something he's always been friendly to me. And then just a week or so ago, he uh, was down in Vegas at the G League showcase. And my buddy calls me and goes, yo, Ainge has come to every one of my kids games the last three days. And we're all golfing buddies. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But he comes to the games. And then afterwards, he takes my kid aside and starts talking to him about the game and helping him. He goes, is this guy for real? He and is. I said, he that's, is for real, I said right? that's no. I said you don't understand. That's Danny Ainge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He, yeah, he I know. shows I get up. That feeling. He from cares. Being twelve. He cares about people. He follows up. He's been unbelievable influence for good for, with my own children, and uh, you know, as as good as he is as a as a GM, one of the best in the world, uh, as one of the most respected guys in in the game of basketball. He's just he's just a real guy. I mean, yeah. sit he's, over there and laugh. He's a star in every he just, he in, just in every part of his life. He just gets you know? it. So, he's, all right, he's so that closes the chapter on our guest, Danny Ainge. Now yeah. the spotlight's on yeah, you. Yeah, I, I have to tell you about this guy because he was a very very good shooter in college. So that, that's just a given. He can still shoot it. So I actually brought I I, I, I called one of his most recent games. Did you remember this? So. It was a three-on-three tournament, and he and Ryan Smith are playing, have a team in. <laughs> and Ryan asked me if I would come up. It was, and it was, it, was, it was a celebration of our, our dear friend Clayton Riggs that yeah. passed away. And we, so we were having an annual three-on-three tournament, and he's a good friend of Ryan's and, and, and a good friend of, uh, of Brian's. Um, but but who, who else? It was you and Ryan, and who was your third? I can't even remember who the third was. I don't know. It was somebody that was supposed to yeah. pass it. Yeah, it was supposed to pass it. <laughs> And the assist th- man. And, it's like and, the bag man. And this guy man. was still taking Danny's advice. Shooting every time. Shooting, and, and he can still knock down threes from as far as you want to step back. I know we call it Jimmer range now, but back in the day it was Brian Santiago range. It was it's, Santa range. It's still Brian Santiago range. It's yep. good. We, we've had some epic shootouts. And it was fun, and they won it, by the way. Yeah. Ian Ryan and a guy they picked up won the three-on-three tournament. Had, and they played against some good teams. We've had some epic shootouts through the years with Jimmer and I had one mm-hmm. right before the San Diego State BYU game when we were both ranked in the top five. Who won it? I was dressed like this, took off my jacket. Uh, we played a game where if you get up two, so if I shoot one and you shoot one, if I make it and you miss, I'm up one. Right. So it took about 170 shots from the three point <laughs> line. Uh, we probably both combined missed six or seven, eight shots. Yeah. And I had two shots to close him out in the 150s and missed them both. That's nice. You took one for the team so he'd have his confidence. And and then he beat me. It still bothers me to this day. (laughs) Sounds like But the next day was one of the great epic performances of all time in BYU basketball history. Everybody had been doubting Jimmer and Jackson, those guys all day. So you felt you'd help prepare him? I prepared him. And which game, was, was it the... At San Diego State. Oh, down there. Down there. NBA high school. Oh, oh CBS. that was something. At Fresno State, you go one and three against the Cougars. 92-93 and 93-94, those two seasons. What was your best game amongst those four against BYU? Uh, you won uh, in 93 73 yeah. That was in, at your place in Fresno. We, we beat them twice that year. I Are you know, sure? We, yeah, I'm 100% positive. I went us. to the Fresno records they, for this. They, yeah, it's, it's inaccurate. Uh, <laughs> we beat them because because we beat them in the regular season at Fresno, and then we beat them in the NIT. Oh, you know oh, what? maybe you I didn't, didn't have go the NIT, down the regular season. Yeah, before. we yeah. beat them in the NIT. I stand correct. Uh, so they were two and three then that season. Again. So those we, two we seasons. Played them, yeah, we played them four times that season. They beat us in Provo. They beat us in Salt Lake uh, in the conference tournament, and then we mm. beat them both times down there. But my best game was one of my best weekends. In, in my college career, 
Uh, Utah came to town on Thursday night, you know, back in the great mm -hmm. whack, yeah. you know, the weekends. 16 team it just, thing. You're playing two, you're playing two, uh, it was like the old whack. It was New Mexico and UTIP. It was Colorado State and Wyoming. It yeah. was BYU, BYU Utah. And Utah. Yeah. It was just epic. So CSU Air Force. Yep. Yeah, Utah came in uh, on Thursday night. I had a triple double, one of the few that they've ever had at Fresno State. Went 25, 11, and 10. Majerus got thrown out of the arena. <laughs> it was a beautiful night. It's a win win. And then uh, BYU came in a couple nights later, and I almost had a second triple double. I had 11 points, 10 rebounds, and nine assists, I think, and we beat them. Uh, Why didn't you play here? Uh, it, it's a great question, and and a lot of people have asked me that through the years. Uh, my brothers played at BYU. I had a great relationship with the coaching staff at BYU, and uh, it, it, it actually was a turning point uh, for me, uh, opened some significant doors. I wouldn't be at BYU now had I not made the decision to go to Fresno, but I was coming to BYU. Uh, I had... We had talked with Bradley, with Ken Roberts, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. obviously Randy Reed and the others. We were going to make a run at it. We'd all grown up saying, hey, at some point we're going to end all up I'll be there. together at BYU, right? And uh, I was uh, on my mission, came back uh, from my mission, uh, thinking that I would either come straight over to BYU or play another year for Duke Reed, who was Roger's brother over at Utah Valley. Yeah. And uh, I went back to Utah Valley. And about two or three weeks in, a guy by the name of Gary Colson uh, came into the gym. He was the longtime New Mexico coach, was the head coach Remember of Fresno Gary. State. Yep. Yep. And he walked up to me and just said, hey, I know you're a BYU guy, but I want you to come to Fresno and just spend a couple of days. I know you're going to BYU. Just come spend a couple of days with me at Fresno. And at the time, I'm like, yeah, I'll take a little weekend trip to Fresno. Sure, why not? Yeah. Uh, what why harm not? could come yeah, from that? So I, I went. And uh, while I was there, uh, started to pay a little bit of attention to the people they brought out all of the including steve cleveland we had he was over at a barbecue they had sherm Sobey. And, and, and steve at the time was he at fresno city college he was at, the at time? fresno city college right and and so they brought out a bunch of the lds brass in fresno members of the church to kind of help make me feel comfortable but i was just on a little weekend joy i mean i wasn't going to fresno state uh but something interesting happened and uh, my dad and mom, who I revere, had always told me uh, to make sure that I paid attention and followed my feelings. Yeah. And I was sitting in the back of a car with a couple of the players and riding down Blackstone Avenue, uh, enjoying the food. You know, everybody that knows me knows I love food. And in fact, I'm one of the, <laughs> on the breakfast of the recruiting trip. <laughs> Gary Colson looked at me and said, B., I'm recruiting you to play basketball, not football. <laughs> you can like this. I yeah. had the pancakes. I had all of it. But I was in the back of a car uh, driving down the street, Blackstone Avenue. still remember exactly where I was. And I had a very, very strong impression that I needed to go to Fresno State. And uh, it caught me off guard. And so I started to pay attention, started to listen to what coaches were talking about. I started to notice, you know, the red wave had a huge following. Yeah. But I really started to listen and started asking some questions. And I never told anybody that uh, while I was down there. But I came home and uh, my mom and dad said, hey, how'd it go? And I just said, hey, I had a great experience. And uh, I had a funny thing happen. And this, I told them what had happened. I would had this really strong impression that I needed to go to Fresno State. And my dad looked at me and said, B, you need to follow your feelings. Mm. And you need to do that. And so I... I went to, I, I actually took a picture in a Fresno State jersey that they had sent with me and spinning a ball, and I sent it to him in the mail. I uh, sent it to Coach Colson, and he got it, and didn't, I didn't send any note with it. I actually wrote on it and said, once a bulldog, probe a bulldog, always a bulldog. Bulldog to bulldog. Mm -hmm. And uh, he didn't know what to do, so he called the Reeds and said, hey, I just got a picture of Santiago spinning a ball on his finger in a Fresno State jersey. It said, once a bulldog, always a bulldog. You know anything about it? And Duke Reed came out on the floor and said, hey, what's going on? And I said... During a game. No, this was in practice. Oh, in practice. practice. Yeah. And I said, hey, I, I committed to Fresno State. I'm going to go to Fresno State. That's the right thing for me. And he just said, 
no, I need you to go over and talk to Roger. I need you to. That's, <laughs> yeah, this isn't, it's a family this deal. Isn't okay. And I just said, Coach, I said, you got to trust me. This is the right thing for me. And we talked about it later. Uh, but I went on and had a great year at Utah Valley. And I was I literally got home a day before the, se- the uh, school year started. I was probably 20 pounds overweight. But I from your mission from my mission, but yeah. I, I, you know, I averaged played 20, yourself into shape and I averaged twenty points. I think gave nine assists a game. I shot fifty percent from the three point line. Had a great year and played myself into shape, and and then things started coming together, and I had a great experience at Fresno State. That's that's fascinating. It leads right into this next question, uh, and we'll get to your current role and and the Big Twelve and all that stuff coming up. So hang on, folks. But uh, Steve Cleveland's hired as head coach. At BYU mm-hmm. in 1997, you go to his house uh-huh. and make the pitch to him that he needs to bring you with him. Yeah. Why did you feel that at that moment, this job coming to Provo and to get involved with BYU was so important? Well, you know, looking back, uh, Cleve was a really positive influence in my life in Fresno. I taught his uh, son in seminary. Uh, Steve Cleveland was super good to me. Yeah. And uh, it was actually Gary Colson that called me on the phone. I was at work in Fresno. I'd come back from playing in Puerto Rico. Been playing down there for two or three years. Thought I was going to play in the Olympics till I got hurt. And I was back in Fresno working, and my phone rang, and it was Gary Colson who said, I'm calling Steve Cleveland. Um, you need to go with him to BYU. And... That was the moment where I just thought, wow, because I, I hadn't really thought about it. Interestingly enough, I was one of the ones that knew Cleve was in, involved with the job. We had never talked about me being right. involved with him. I just knew, and then he had told me, hey, I'm going to Provo tomorrow. I'm going to be introduced to the new coach. Then I got that call from from uh, Colson saying, you need to go with him. So anyways, long story short, I, I couldn't eat or drink for about – three or four weeks, I was just like, wow, that's super intriguing. I'd really like to get my master's degree. That'd be an unbelievable opportunity. I'm from Provo. I kind of know the lay of the land. I can, you know, have Cleves back. But I, in my mind, I started started to make sense to me. So I did. I went over to his house. Yeah. Said, come over. Rose was at his house at the time, Coach Rose. And we just started talking. And even then, it wasn't like, hey, I'm – because at the time he wasn't even sure. Well, they didn't have a position, right? There were back in the day, right. you didn't have an office person. Yeah, yeah, there wasn't a director just, of basketball operations. He just had the coaches, and he had already talked about who he was going to have on his staff. But then he said, "You know, I'm going to talk to him about hiring a you know, director of basketball operations." Uh, at the time, I think it was an administrative assistant or something, and and then that process took a while, and uh, there was a vice president at the time that kind of pushed it through and if you remember the name Dwayne Busby yep. oh yeah it was just such a great great part of BOU football and so close with Lavelle and Kalani but Dwayne and I came in at the same time they approved the position for football for and basketball and Dwayne and I came in at the same time and and you and Steve shared an office and we not only shared an office <laughs> but I was I, mean, I think I had two or three jobs at the time trying to make ends meet I was going to business school yeah I was sharing an office with him uh, there were a couple of times where I was like hey Steve could you step out of the office I gotta, <laughs> I gotta make a call for my other job I gotta, <laughs> you know but I say this with with respect he it only could have worked because of the relationship we had yeah and the type of person he is he he was so good to me and treated me like I was like right in the middle of it and He's the one that really opened all the doors for me to, uh, to where I'm currently at. And, and I'll always have just a great amount of love and appreciation for Cleve. We reached out to him today. Oh, yes. You were coming on. Oh, and yeah. we said, hey, what, do you want to, do you have anything for us to, to <laughs> yeah. share? And he sent us this. <laughs> he said, uh, he goes, hey, no one's, in, you, got, you know, Cleve. Yeah. Like we all love Cleve, by the way. He's so listening tonight. Hey, he, Steve. He says, no one is more passionate or competitive than B. He would usually sit at the end of the bench nearest the scorekeeper. He'd start barking at the officials, opposing players, and was generally wound up. I don't remember the game, but I do remember losing my mind and yelling at B to get to the end of the bench. Then I yelled at Dave Rose to make sure he stayed there. (laughs) He says he got better, 
But he still had his moments at the end of the bench yelling at the officials. Hey, listen, sometimes <laughs> those officials needed a little something, something. And uh, do you know what game? You know, do you know what he's talking about? I know exactly what he's talking about. What we is were actually it? In Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> so he does remember. I know exactly where it was. We were in Hawaii, and uh, it was we were playing in a tournament over there at BOE Hawaii, and uh, it was actually Terrell a day was playing and. Uh, what was the Rainbow Classic or something? Yeah, no, it was BYU Hawaii. Okay. Had some sort of a tournament there, and we were playing at BYU Hawaii's campus, and <laughs> Terrell got stole the ball, and what it had nothing to do with the officials. He stole the ball and uh, had one of our guys out ahead of him, wide open. And by the way, Terrell the day is my guy. Even to this day, we were texting during the Gonzaga game. One of the best players ever, at BYU, yeah. by the yeah. way. Dude was a bucket. Uh, but he didn't pass the ball ahead and dribbled all the way down, gave time for the defense to come back. So as he's going, I'm yelling at him, pass it, <laughs> pass it, <laughs> pass the ball. And he dribbles all the way down. Guy kind of ends up fouling him and doesn't – score the bucket and has to go to the free throw line, it would have been a layup. Well, Cleve didn't like it. So Cleve's like, hey, get down to the end of the bench. <laughs> and I turn around, I'm like, yeah, I'll go to the end of the bench, but somebody tell him to pass the ball. <laughs> and it was just like it, that. It. I, I, no. love, I love that he said to Dave Rose, hey, you get down there, make sure he stays down there too. No, he tells but, it, Dave. but it was good. But the best thing is after the game, <laughs> Cleve came over to me and goes, sorry, B. And I go, coach. We're just all in this for one reason. That's we're in it for each other to help win games. And I said, I'm sorry that I I was so passionate about it, but we got to play the game the right way. I mean, we were battling that first year. I mean, we won yeah. nine games. It was heroic what happened. And yeah, but we were all so invested. I mean, you think about who was on the bench. You're talking about some of the most passionate people: Heath Schroyer, yeah, yeah, Dave Rose, Dave Rose Steve myself, Cleveland, you, Nate Call. I mean, there wasn't a lack of passion oh, on the no. bench. It's a wonder we didn't set a school record for technical so, fouls. So yeah. The best was I, I, never, I never got teed up. Uh, and back in the – you know how the coaches go out and talk? Yeah. Well, back in the day, you, the rules were the, the director of basketball operations couldn't be in that circle. Oh, interesting, yeah. So while they'd go out and talk, I'd talk to the team. <laughs> <laughs> I'd get the team. Get them fired mind. up. So before he, before up. this guy comes back before in here, let me tell you. this guy comes in here, this is <laughs> – and we used to have some good See, Brian goes nuts about, about the same things. Like the other night in the game, in the game the one, the Pepperdine game, um, and this drives me nuts, uh, long rebound, outlet goes out. Now it's a two-on-one. And – the guy with the ball is slightly behind, and I'm like, advance the ball. Get it up the floor. Like, give it up and get it back. Like, give it up, and you're going to get it back for a layup. Instead, the player, I'm not naming names, the player takes it all the way down the floor and shoots a contested layup against the one defender and misses. Yeah. And the other team rebounds it. Now, and we went to, and I'm very calm on the air, and they go to the break, and I just look at Dave, and I'm like, what in the heck? Why doesn't he give up the yeah, ball? I, I just, I was taught to play the game the right way. You, you give it up, and you're going to get it back. Well, you've just... You're just playing the game the right way to win the game. And so from Provo High, mm -hmm. Utah Valley, to Fresno State, I was just always to Puerto Rico. I was just taught to play the game the right way. Never a personal agenda. So I have issue when people have personal agendas on the court because yeah. the only thing that should matter is playing for each other and playing to win the game. Amen. Fast forward to Monday morning, July 23rd, last summer. Texas and Oklahoma drop a bombshell that they're leaving the Big 12 to join the SEC. What's the first thing that went through your mind? We have a chance. They need us. That's the first thing that went through my mind. They need us. Based on really nothing since the talks from five years ago, or had you heard things? So, no, the, what, what we had maintained when, when uh, they had talks earlier, five years earlier, we had maintained that had they expanded, we were in. Mm -hmm. But we really believed that. We all know what happened. There were some deals made to maintain. They didn't need us at the time. Right. But when Texas and Oklahoma left, the first thing that went through my mind and we talked was we have a chance. They need us. And the other thing that we had done, the things that we had learned from five years earlier, is we have to be so good that they need us, that they 
they have to come to us and go, no, there we is. Want the the we, we want the whole Cougar Nation. We want the whole ball of wax. We know exactly what we're getting. And that was, that was why uh, there was so much excitement and enthusiasm <coughs> is, okay, if they're leaving, we got it. we're in a great position. So, the, you know, one of the things that was so cool about how it all went down is uh, President Worthen, who I've seen President Worthen, and he's been at BYU for a while. Yeah. I've seen him in a lot of different scenarios, a lot of different. President Worthen was at his unbelievable very best when we went to present the first time in the Big 12. Mm. He was unbelievable. He, he has, he's so bright, got such a good mind, and he just painted a, an incredible picture. And there, there was a lot of research done. We, we came up with an unbelievable presentation that first time. We had, we had some unbelievable consultants. We had some of the best business minds in the world helping us. People were coming out of the woodworks, Cougar Nation all over the world, all in, telling us whatever you need. It was unbelievable. So we we had done that previously. So this time around, President Worthen, in in trying to just express, hey, a couple things like this is who we are, they stopped him and said, we know exactly who you are previously because from five years earlier and basically said that's why we want you. Is they knew they they wanted us for exactly who we were, and then you heard it in all the press conferences. It, it yeah. wasn't like yeah. they had to say, "Oh, we're taking them in spite of." They were like, "No, we want we, we everything want them about and everything BYU. they bring." That's right, and that's why it was so exciting. Yeah, it was it was, it was like let's go. So it, the phrase has been said over and over again. Hey, the table was set with the f- presentations five years ago when they did. I mean, it's what you're telling us is that's absolutely true. The table was 100%. set. Hundred percent. And 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 uh, and such a good foot was put forward at that time that it was a no brainer when it came around. So now I want to take you to, so Tom Homo gets on the phone. Tom told us in November it was it was he said it was just a short phone call. So I'm just get on the phone and uh, it's Big uh, Twelve Commissioner Bob Bowlesby, and uh, he basically invites us to the, to join the conference. Um, so Tom hangs up the phone. You guys look at each other. Then what? <laughs> uh. You know, the, the, probably the, the word that comes to mind is just gratitude that we we're going to have the opportunity to do something that we dreamed about. It's what kept us. I mean, it's what kept us going. We had always said we have to find our way in. We have to find our way into the game. We we stand on the shoulders of some of the greatest athletes and some of the greatest coaches and some of the greatest administrators in the history of the game. We have to find our way in. We have to be in the game, because there's you're, there's the Power Five, and then there's the you're in or you're out. Everything you're else, out. everything else. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and and we have been trying and and doing an unbelievable job of being nationally relevant. Yeah, outside of the Power Five, but when you're in, it's just different. And we had always believed that we were going to find our way in, and we had been told over and over and over again by the doubters and the naysayers, no chance it'll never happen because of this, because of that. And then we would look back at them and say, oh, no, no, it's going to happen. That's what kept us going. And we believed it. And we believed that we were good enough, and we kept talking to our coaches about let's be so good that they want us, that they need us. And look at what happened over those years. We had national champions. We had teams that were right there knocking on the door. We did some incredible things. We were nationally relevant across the board, and that was our presentation to the Big 12 the first time, was, hey, you know exactly who we are. And we, you look at it, in just about every sport, we can compete in the Big 12. Brian Santiago, the Deputy Athletic Director at BYU, is on the Wise Guys tonight. So Tom hangs up. You two stare at each other, this feeling of gratitude. Who'd you call next? Uh, we actually were pretty tight-lipped about it. Yeah. Because... You like, know, did you you until wanted until to scream somebody, it to the world, but yeah, what? Yeah, but until, some, until you sign... Yeah, until the contract's signed, the it's contract not signed, right? Until the contract's signed, we've all been in this business long enough. But, uh, 
you know, obviously internally the people that needed to know were advised, and then we just you call Mark Pope. Uh, he he was the coaches were brought into the circle pretty quick. Pretty quick. Once everything was done, because the last thing so you for there was do, a few days you knew you were in before anyone else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and then you you've got to sign contracts. You got to make sure that everything is is a hundred percent signed, sealed, and delivered. Then you can bring your coaches in. I still remember the bringing the coaches in. We we had a meeting. Um, it was late one night and brought all the coaches into the SAB. And Tom, you know, shared the news with them. Said we wanted you to be the first ones to know. This is it. It's happening. That's so. They're cool. announcing it. There was a <laughs> there was a great feeling of excitement, and there was some people some trepidation. Going, oh, some people oh man, this is not going to be easy, well, right? No, because let, let's face it. It, the whole game's changed. Yeah. And and if you're not enthusiastic about going against the best in the country night in and night out in every sport. And not everyone gonna, is. And not everyone is. And, yeah. and, 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 and there's pressure that's different. Yeah. You know, the, the stakes are higher. The the pressures on coaches are higher. The Everybody's going to scrutinize more. Uh, you're looking at those schools up on the board. Yeah. Uh, you start thinking about... <laughs> Obviously, football, you start thinking about men's basketball. Oh, yeah. man. You know, we were talking about in the last segment. Night in and night out is just like Gonzaga coming in there. So it, it, this is – but that was there, – there was great enthusiasm, uh, excitement, passion, uh, a feeling of let's go. We have work to do between now and when we tip in the fall of 2023. We have to be ready. And it's going to take some transition, and that's where we kind of launched into. And it was like, let's go. We've got to make some significant investments. We've got to yeah. make sure that they have the resources available to them so we can be great. And, and, and this is all still going on, right? Oh, yeah, there, we, there's still this build that has it, to take place between now and then, right? Yeah, and listen, we, we, don't, we don't want to just limp into the Big 12. We want to be ready yeah. so we can compete day one across the board in every sport. We want to compete. The official invite comes on Friday morning, September 10th. The next day, this is 2021, <laughs> BYU goes out and beats Utah in front of a sold-out Lavelle Edwards Stadium. Has there ever been a pair of back-to-back -back days more significant than those two in the history of BYU sports and maybe even BYU? Super meaningful uh, because of the magnitude of what had just been announced, the buildup of needing to find a way to beat Utah. The feeling in that stadium that night was palpable. If you remember, uh, you could feel it before the game. I mean, I said to a couple of people, like, this is, can you feel it? It felt like, and, it and felt like and Jets Miami, were coming. It felt like the Miami and game then a little bit. The Jets. <laughs> Anytime lower, you know Jets are coming. Then the Jets lower the boom <laughs> yeah. on the stadium. To thanks, the to our, thanks to our buddy Clark. Right? Oh, yeah, it was awesome. We've, so, we've had the guy that coordinates all that on the show. You know, it, it, they lowered the oh, boom. Oh, yes, they did. And, and there were a couple people that like hit the ground. They thought the world was ending. <laughs> but the feeling <laughs> when those Jets took off, the way the team played that night, yeah. uh, the Nakua brothers yep. had a big part in us winning that game. Uh, that was those were two super meaningful days that just kind of jump started where we're going. And and the enthusiasm has been the meter has been at a ten ever since. It's like so fun. It's so exciting and and so challenging. Yeah, there's a lot to be done still. Yeah. By the way, we talked to Clark um, and and we said uh, those jets seemed really low. Is, can can you go below the hard deck? Like, and did you go below the deck that you're not supposed to go go below for that? And he, he looked at us and he said, "It's classified information that we cannot talk about." <laughs> well, Jen Rockwood was on this show, and she said it scared her to death. <laughs> yes, because they came in. Well, they were a little late because the band finished early. Yeah. So they kicked in some burners and they came flying in oh and my right out over the side. We showed the part of the soccer game. They're just playing and all of a sudden Armageddon oh. flies over. Right over the soccer and, game. And they were on their way to the stadium. And they went right at Mount Tipinogos and then just went poof, and just turned and missed it. Hey, Danny and Michelle Ainge were coming to the game. They sat with us. That night. Michelle hit the ground. <laughs> she did. <laughs> on the ground all the way. Thought it, And we laughed. It's it, so it, funny. It, there was so much momentum from the announcement. There was so – and my honestly, my favorite part about that football game was 
when they interviewed Kyle Whittingham, mm -hmm. he said, um, we got pushed around, physically beat up, and that doesn't ever happen to us. Yeah, it happened that night. And, and to go play in the Big 12, we're going to have to be able to do that. To be that's, physical and out physical people. That's right. And the consistency, right? Right. You have to have enough depth that you can be consistent night in, night out, playing against what we're going to play against. Right. And, I, and, and right that's, that's, but that's what you want. And, and, and you know, football is probably the most prepared because they've been playing a Power 5 schedule as an independent. Yeah. So we played. I mean, their Pac-12 championship last year. We, we've <laughs> played series of games where you're playing against those caliber teams night in and night out. And, yeah. and we've had to be consistently physical. Yep. But, uh, yeah, it's, that, that's going to be the challenge. Is we're yeah. going to have to be able to withstand. How many times a day are you asked the question that we're about to ask you is yeah. where is the schedule for the fall for the Big 12 football and what's taking so long? Well, listen, I, I don't oh, wait, think First of all, how many times a day do you get asked? I get asked. <laughs> we've, get asked, asked. You, we've asked you at five times Every time we see you, we ask yeah, you. Yeah, and... I think it's it's not rocket science that there's obviously a uh, two-pronged conversation hiccup. with two teams <laughs> on when they are or not leaving the conference. And, you know, everybody's like, well, let's just do 23 schedule and then we can figure the rest out later. But the reality is the what I'm being told is the conference said that it'll be out by the end of the month. It was supposed to be out by the middle of the month. Supposed to be out in December. Supposed to be but, out by November, yeah, whatever, yeah. or something. Yeah, too. but it, it'll be out by the end of the month, which, you know, uh, we get it. We we've seen, we've seen on paper the teams, and all I say is everybody better be ready. Better be ready to go. <laughs> better be ready for some October and November. Now wait a second. Expound on so that, we, even we, though yeah. you can't expound on what what is when you look at those teams. And Tom had said to in an interview back in November that. You knew who was coming, and you knew where BYU was going. Just didn't have the dates yeah. and some of that stuff. But as you as you look at that, and I think Cougar Nation will see it and see the realization of this is happening. You've seen that and yeah. felt that. Yeah, it's it's awesome. The away games awesome. Home games are awesome. The schedule looks awesome. Uh, the biggest change for Cougar Nation is. Right now, with the independent schedule, we're, we're used to September and October being heavy, heavy games, loaded, and then it tails and then off. It tails off. Now you're going to see the opposite. You can build. So yeah. you're going to have no. You're going to have October and November games, super meaningful games for potentially conference championships, which we were used to in the past with the Utah game always being on Thanksgiving weekend, usually for a championship. Uh, it's that's what it's going to be. Is you're going to see a heavy. Uh, dose of really important games in October and November, whereas all the really big games the last few years have been up front in the schedule. And much September. much more traditional, what yeah. we're used to in the old Mountain yeah. West. So um, I won't make you tell us when you think, but, but let's just make an assumption. I'm going to make an assumption that somehow Texas and Oklahoma figure out how to only play next season and not in 24. If that happens... Is there a financial windfall for the new members that are coming into the conference, including BYU? Is part of that exit fee maybe come back to BYU? Is is, is that going to be a financial boon for BYU? Well, certainly there's going to be a negotiation if those two teams leave early. But it's not uh, it, it's not uh, classified information for everyone right now to know that if they do leave early, there's a significant penalty they have to pay. Right. To the Big Twelve Conference, which certainly I think it's eighty million, it. isn't it? Well, I unless it's negotiated down unless somewhere. Unless it's negotiated down, and that's per school, if yeah. I'm not right. mistaken. Right. So, and can you, the SEC front the oh, money? Yeah, certainly. So, it just doesn't matter where but, it comes from. But in today's day, I don't care what numbers you're talking about. One hundred sixty million dollars. It's a lot. Is a lot of money in this landscape to have somebody come a year early or have somebody. So to answer your question, Blaine, uh, I guess it could be that that money goes to the conference and how they disperse it is how they disperse it. You know, in their disbursements, it's going to be a couple of years before we're at a full right. uh, uh, share. So I don't know that. But what I do know is that there are significant penalties to protect the conference. Uh, it has not been lost on anyone that it, the way it went down uh, you know, caught the Big 12 off guard 
and, and upset and and not happy. So I'm not sure the Big 12's like at the table going, "Hey, let us see how we can help you." Right. Uh, you make good on your commitments, and the commitment they have is to be in Oklahoma and Texas. Have is and to they be got in the leverage for two more years. They yeah. got leverage because USC is going to the Big Ten a year earlier. Yeah. So that, that's what got them all worried. Yeah. Right? So the, the reality of it is, the Big 12's in a good spot, and really what the Big 12 is doing is trying to hold those two schools accountable to the commitment right. that they made. However, that gets negotiated. I'm sure the SEC will be involved. They'll they'll all negotiate that out. What we have to do is be prepared. Be ready to go play for 2023. <laughs> we got to control the controllables. If BYU moves to a seven-game home schedule down the yeah. road, three non-conference and then yep. four or five Big 12 games. Will that scenario likely include a Las Vegas game? Could. And if so, would that bring relief to the season ticket holder where they don't have to buy for seven games, they buy for six, like normal, and then the Vegas game is uh, everybody gets a shot at it like yeah. like you've done in the past? Yeah, it could be. Uh, the one thing that I, I would say to Cougar Nation, and Cougar Nations continue to come strong, like, mm-hmm. I, I, a little side note, I was super impressed with the – crowd the other night at the Pepperdine game. Yeah. After a heartbreaking so loss. Yeah, we you know, we asked Cougar ourselves like what's what's gonna happen here? And when we walked in the building and it started to fill up up to the top, we were like, all right, Cougar Nation. No, Cougar Nation's been all in. And and there's a lot of enthusiasm moving forward. Back to your question is yeah, it, it could be. There could be games there. Uh but six games or seven, even if you had to have even if you add a seventh game, tickets are a bargain. At Cougar Stadium, compared to the rest of the league, I, I think we're we're competitive, but it's still an unbelievable value to come to that stadium. From those that sit in the prime seats to those that sit in the not so prime seats, there is a, everyone is welcome at that stadium, and they're getting an unbelievable value. To pay another thirty to a couple hundred bucks to have a seventh game is very reasonable, more than fair. And uh, I, I think and Cougar Nation will do it, right? Well, I, yeah, they've always showed up. And I think Cougar Nation understands we can't be in the Big 12 and operate in an independent and a WCC mindset. We need Cougar Nation more than ever to come to the table. We need our ticket sales. We need to be competitive in our pricing. I had, a, I had one of our donors call me the other day and offer to buy every one of the front row courtside seats next season for $25,000 a seat. Just to help out. And he said, the reason I'm saying this is if we're going to be in the game, ask us to be in the game. Wow. We know you're trying to be respectful in what you're charging, but Big 12 basketball coming into the Marriott Center, charge us to sit on that front row. We should pay that much money. It's wow. worth it, and we want to help the program. We want you guys to be in the game. Ask us to help, we'll help. And we saw it during COVID when Tom Homo went yeah. to Cougar Nation and said, we need you. Cougar Nation all over the world came to the table. We, Cougar Nation is, is on fire and as powerful right now as it's ever been, and we, we need them. And if we have a seven-game schedule and the price of the tickets goes up a little bit, because we play in Provo, we have confidence that uh, Cougar Nation is going to come to the table Step and say, up. let's go. Do you see eight game home schedules coming? I don't know. That's probably If a you've stretch. got four, if you're playing nine league games in one year, there's four on the road, the Big 12. Yeah. I think we were talking about uh, you got three non-conference scheduled for 24. We were talking about we earlier. I can't remember. There's a couple we, where I'm like, whoa. But obviously those still can move a little around. Little we're, we're, that's probably a stretch, but. But it'll it'll all balance out. You gotta you gotta keep some balance there. Yeah, we yeah. we understand that the Olympic sports schedules, like I'm talking spot, uh, soccer, yeah. women's volleyball, they're already done, yep. um, but they haven't been released. What what can you tell us about those and when that release will be? Let's go. It's gonna be fun, right? It, you, I mean, I've looked at the schedules for the sports. I oversee ten of the sports. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, and the coaches just, have they seen them? Oh yeah, they've yeah. seen them. And you know, for the most part. Most of our coaches are pretty excited about it. Yeah, you know, you, you start talking about some of those Olympic sports. Our volleyball team's not afraid to play the oh. best teams in the country, or our no. soccer team. Our or soccer or team's not afraid to play the best cross schedule. country. Our cross country but teams. We, our we had Jen. Teams. We had Jen. No. Jen in, and uh, and we said, so what? What's the jump going to be like to the Big Twelve? And she goes, We're going to compete for a championship right away. Yeah, and, and like no fear. But but you look at it. Our our softball team 
They yeah. already play a non-conference schedule against the best teams in the yeah, country. They're, none of those teams they're are not, afraid. They're not afraid. And, and you know, there are a couple of teams that are going to have a tougher... Baseball's got to build. Baseball's got to build. But I'm telling you, I'm, I, I was telling Ainge today, I'm really excited about our baseball team and the, the transfers that they've had come in, mm -hmm. the, the staff that they're building. They've had a couple of big-time uh, pitchers come into the program. We're going to compete. We're going to compete right away. But when you see the schedules, listen. It's going to be fun. It's just going to be fun. It, those That's what you're getting right. night in and night out in every sport. It's going to be awesome. Let's finish with this, and then uh, Blaine's going to hit you up with five questions. Okay. you got a sneak preview of when it, when we yeah. were grilling Ainge on those. Um, you remain very close to the Lavelle Edwards family, and um, especially with Patty, Lavelle's wife, as their bishop leading up to – and through those final days for uh, for Lavelle when he was when he was still with us, what impressed you the most about him during that time? We all know the wins, we know the championships, and all of that stuff. But you were with him in the tender moments of of those last few days, um, conducted the funeral and, and all of those things. Uh, what 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 stood out? Uh, probably his humility. Uh, wanting to be in good standing with the Lord. Uh, we had some unbelievably tender conversations. Uh, a couple weeks before he passed, calling me and wanting me to come over and settle his tithes. Uh, the quiet, behind-the-scenes acts of kindness to members of the ward that nobody ever saw. Uh, the letters to youth in the ward that were struggling, telling them that he believed in them, including my son in the MTC. I had no idea. Uh, when he passed, my son wrote me a note and then shared the letter that Lavelle had written him in the MTC. Uh, those, uh, The tenderness with Patty, and I don't mean to get emotional, but uh, he, he was... He was one of the most remarkable human beings that I've ever been around in my life. Everywhere we went, he was revered in the football circles. But, it, you know, you, you mentioned Kyle Morrell earlier in the show. You have to remember uh, Kyle Morrell's comments at that 84 <laughs> celebration about the letter he received in the mail at a really tough time in his life. That's the stuff, you know, in this world that we live in, in this business that we're in, if we're not in it to try to help these young men and young women fly, help them overcome the challenges, help them go fly and make a difference in the world, inspire them, uh, then, then why are we in this business? And that's what probably touched me the most about Lavelle is, and I've always said this, uh, there are only a few coaches at BYU that if they got on the phone and called every one of their former players and said, I need you back here tomorrow, that every single one of them would come. Lavelle's one of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we saw it. In the, like, everyone came. The walk-ons came. The All-Americans came. The rivals came. The This guy, he... He, it was about way more than football. And by the way, he was an awfully good coach yeah. that won a national championship and put BYU on the map forever. But it was all the other stuff that he did to change people's lives. And that's what I got to see from a, from a, from a super uh, close uh, situation. The other thing is he was private. Yeah. He just wasn't about himself he was private he handled his business in private he took care of his family and then you know just all the way down you know one of the last people he spoke to was jim mcmahon uh jim had gotten word that he was close and i still remember just passing the phone to him it's one of the last people he spoke to uh and just the expressions of love it's just, it doesn't get any better than Lavelle Edwards.
fat he's not far behind. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, he's got Andy Reid still trying to win a Super Bowl mm-hmm. to get, get that thing done again uh, against the Jags on Saturday. Fred Warner trying to get there. They play the Cowboys on Sunday. Those are the Cougars in the playoffs. And uh, we wish them both the very best. Great examples of great ambassadors of what you're talking about. But that's, that's the thing is I think what Lavelle created was a love and a passion for this place that carries on to today. I mean, you just talked about two guys that in, in the last year, Andy Reid's been in that stadium. Mm-hmm. He's been in talking to the coaches, the high school coaches. Fred Warner's been at our basketball game at Santa Clara last year. They're, they're there before the Stanford game. Before the Stanford right? game. Yeah. They're, they're all in for this place. And, and, and that goes across the board. I, I just am well, so and impressed And, and with Andy's guys. patterned a lot of what he's done after Lavelle. Lavelle was a great yeah. mentor to him. I, I love when Andy came to the game when they, when they had that bye week. And, and obviously, if Andy comes to a game, Brian and these guys, we're going to find him a place to sit wherever he wants. You know where Andy wanted to sit? Just up in the stands with his family, with everybody. Oh yeah, we had a we had a box for him up there. Yeah. We, no, Andy just we wanted to sit in the stand. <laughs> and he and he said that. And he said, "Yeah, I just I just want to be a normal guy." He's Andy Reid. They don't get any better than no. that. No, I mean he's like, just he's the best. Was it not just the greatest when they finally broke oh. through? Yeah, like if you, it, it, it was. And they got a shot. My, they was, got a legitimate shot to get another one. Shot. And the thing that I the thing that says the most is when he did break through. The response from his players, former oh. players, the people like every coach it, in the league, every player in the league was, respects him. It's just that that's yeah. that's the stuff where you and know he's in the, the and he's built like. his thing after um, after Lavelle and people would always ask me like, hey, you met with Lavelle every year for your annual meeting, and then he and I get got closer when I was done playing and broadcasting. But um, they'd say, what would you talk about? And I said, very little about football we would just talk about life and how i was doing and all these kinds of things like every every time i talked to lavelle that's what it was about it wasn't really about football and it's just funny because when andy and i talk we hardly ever talk about football it's just like lavelle we just talk about what's going on with life and what's going on with kids and what's doing all that he he's built just like lavelle because lavelle was his mentor yeah and and being around tom homo being around bosco being around chad lewis uh the way they revere Lavelle, and you know, it's you're not going to find a better human being in college athletics than Tom Homo. That's just that's just one of the best human beings. He's been done an unbelievable job as the athletic director, but he was mentored and taught by Lavelle. Lavelle. Yeah, and they feel a sense of responsibility. Kalani feels a deep sense of responsibility yes, he does. to do things the right way because Lavelle asked him to take care of this program. It's just, it's awesome. Let's finish with five questions for Brian Santiago, the deputy AD at BYU, and then we're going to throw out our, we'll give you our inspirational quote of the week yep. and say goodnight. Yep, so favorite sports movie, B? <laughs> you know, it's going to be Hoosiers. I'll I be know, honest, no. I did not expect Chariots of Fire it's from Char- Danny. I mean, Danny goes with Chariots, with Chariots of Fire. With Chariots of Fire. I, I love... Uh, I love Rudy. All right. I love Rudy, too. And Ga- and Gavin gives me a little bit of hassle. He's like, better than Remember the Titans? I go, no, they're different. They're I like different. them both. I like them both. I love Remember the and Titans. We, we, we've, had love- a chan- we've had a chance to meet Rudy, who's joined the church, yeah. and, and we did a thing with him back at Notre Dame when we were back there playing, yeah. so we've gotten to know him a little bit, which makes me even love it more. Yeah, it's just, uh, I, I just, I love the story. I love the chance. Un- underdog. Yeah. You know, I got, I just come from a family with my two brothers that are both walk-ons and Played, had great careers at BYU, and I just love the whole family shoot three pointers. Is that what's oh, going yeah. on over Everybody there? Everybody can shoot it. Everybody can shoot it. Favorite, One of us can shoot it better. Favorite singer <laughs> or band? Uh, I know I, you, you guys talked about it already. I've never been a country music. Yeah, me guy. either. Um, but I'm, I'm learning from Brenda. But by uh, the way, Brian's wife also plays tennis with Michelle. And yeah, Brenda, Kim, they, they Kim's they all, all in on this tennis. And, and by the way. Kim is also very intense. She's, she's can't imagine these, these women are intense yeah, when they play tennis. They, they are so, and they're all good friends. So uh, I, growing up, 
Big Billy Joel guy. Oh, I love Billy Joel. You're the first one that said Billy Joel. Wait, like, wait, wait. I don't know if that's his answer. That was just growing big, up. Okay. You know, Big Billy Joel, and I can go with Billy Joel. I've just Billy seen Joel? some of the greatest concerts. I saw Garth Brooks in his private. Yeah, in Vegas. Oh, in Vegas. Awesome. yeah. Awesome. Which, and, and I actually, I got to tell you a quick story on that. All right. I'll be quick. We're good. Uh, you guys know I don't leave basketball games early ever. But I had tickets to that show. It was my wife's birthday. At the Encore. Get a surprise her. Yeah. At the Encore. And we're playing San Diego in the WCC tournament. And I left at halftime. Oh, were coach, we ahead? And the coach, we were up by two. Okay. The coaches see me leaving the arena. Rose and all. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> you should have gone out and the they, other door. Well, I thought I had made the right <laughs> exit. And then in that show, if you remember, they don't allow you to have phones or anything. They uh-huh. make... They, and so I was trying to check the scores. We, we ended up winning before the show started, which was good. But yeah, that is when good. I turned my phone on after the show, Coach Rose, where were you going? <laughs> <laughs> and I just said, uh, birthday surprise. Yeah, yeah. Gar- I'm sure. Gar- that, Garth is, Garth that, is an Garth unbelievable. Trust me, Cheryl Joel. would rather be at Garth um, than at a basketball my, game. My, Joel. Have, okay. That Garth Billy Brooks Joel. song, like Meet Your Mom, oh my gosh. I can't. It's a good one. So, favorite breakfast cereal. And and for the love, don't say shredded wheat. We've well, already heard I that once said tonight. Frosted come on, shredded come wheat on, just because he on. said shredded wheat. Yeah. But I am uh, I'm a big honey bunches of oats. You know what? That's with very... There. With, with frosted flakes in there to give it a little more sweet. You mix. A little more sugar. A little yeah. more sugar. It's like crossing the streams. With bananas. Rusted flakes. So that's the healthy of, part? That's the healthy part? Well, I get it. Just the banana adds some more sweet. That's like a hat we, trigger. It, that's a hat trigger. On, on this sugar. show, B, we, we respect people that eat lots of sugar in their cereal. I'm, 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 a, I'm a sugar guy. That, that's a pretty good combo right that's there. That's a great one. We've had a bunch of, of, we, we've had with, a bunch with, of guests on this show, and not one has said shredded well, so, wheat. So, so you, know, you know Scott Warner. You know Scott, right? Scott Warner. Yeah. Scott's a huge, like, he's a cereal aficionado. Like, he he... Like, lives it. He likes the. What did he tell you? What did he? Say? What is Scott's? Do you remember what Scott's is? We actually mixed it in eight. Yeah, we, we mixed ate, three we mixed boxes a bunch together that he had us mixed together. I think he's cinnamon toast, cinnamon toast crunch. Cinnamon toast crunch. Yeah, I think that's what he is. Yeah. Yeah. he's Captain Crunch, but not with Crunch Berries, which I don't. Just like understand. it straight. Uh, that's fair. So, but, uh, but I, I'm cinnamon life, or and this is this is my Danny Pla- Danny Plater who came to our house every Sunday for the yeah. last five years of his life. Um, we had in in our cupboard. He would just come in, go right into the cupboard, and get out his Apple Jacks. <laughs> and so, so I'm, I'm not Brian. It'll be a Sunday afternoon, and I just go, and there's still the bin of Apple Jacks. I'm just like, in honor of Danny, I'm having Apple Jacks yeah, today. Why wouldn't you? I gotta have Apple. But Jacks. I do love and will throw frosted mini wheats. Okay, that's in, oh. in with that. See, that's not bad. Frosted, frosted mini wheats is okay, but yeah. shredded wheat. It's like a wheat, circus in your bowl. I'm gonna frosted have to. Meat. We're gonna have to have a talk with Michelle and tell her to let let Danny eat yeah. for fun. So to free him up. Um, <laughs> favorite. Oh, favorite phone call. Yeah, favorite phone that's call. A, favorite phone call. Right. Think about it. <clears throat> Could be uh, with anybody. Yeah. Favorite like phone oh yeah call. oh yeah yeah that's right so. If you're going to have a phone call with it, can they be alive? Oh, is or? this a phone call? No, no, that it's I, one you've taken. Oh, oh one the favorite one you've had. ever yeah. taken. Mm. Think about that. Wow. That's a great question. Uh, back in the day when I hadn't heard from my family for three and a half months in the Dominican Republic when I was on my mission uh, and the phone rang and it was my dad. Nice. I still remember his voice. Yeah. That's a good one. That is a good one. Yeah. I've had some great phone calls from some influential people, but no, like, yeah. Uh, talking to my dad is one of the great joys in life. I just saw your dad the other night and gave him a hug. Just the best. So it's the best, but that that was probably one of the most meaningful phone calls. I hadn't received a letter, hadn't received any word. It was going on four months, and then it was finally Christmas time, and the phone rang, and it was my dad. That was a good. That, that was a good, a good day. One. I remember. It reminds me. Um, after my dad passed away, I was driving back to Las Vegas, and I was calling my mother, and I, she had his cell phone, 
Uh, and uh, so I called that number and it rang a few times and his voicemail picked up and said, hey, leave a message. I'll call you right back. And I thought what I wouldn't do to be able to have my dad call me back. Yeah. So. Yeah, that was a meaningful phone call. Yeah. So, All right. And then, then your favorite Steve Cleveland story, because he gave <laughs> us the one about you. We had a the thought it was only fair. Uh, probably one of my favorite Cleve stories, uh, and certainly there's some golf ones that are great. We've had some great golf moments together. But uh, just know this may be verified no, by the, the other this, party this involved. Is a, this is a good one because this was a part of BOU history. Because uh, there was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that went into Cleve turning around the BYU basketball program. And we were in that fourth year, and uh, us getting a piece of the championship depended on UNLV and Wyoming game. We were in Air Force. Uh, we had won, but we needed the right thing to happen in that other game to get a piece of the championship and be conference champs. In the fourth year, and uh, we were all out trying to get a signal on KSL uh, radio, or it wasn't even KSL. It would have been you know either Wyoming or UNLV trying to just hear yeah. the game because back then you couldn't just right. plug in. And we found one out in the parking lot. Uh, we it, what we needed to happen happened. We were conference champs, and it was sheer joy. And yeah. we. We went, uh, I was with Coach Rose at the time, Cleve was in his room doing the same thing, and we went to Cleve's room. And we were like, we're conference champs. And the <laughs> celebration in that little moment of just kind of a culmination of four years of blood, sweat, and tears, of being sent to the end of the bench, uh, <laughs> sitting at the front of the bench. <laughs> and to, sending Rose there to, to keep you there. To, to just all the blood, sweat, and tears, uh, the <laughs> elation of being conference champs and bringing that pride and, and uh, tradition back to BYU basketball was a great, great moment. Yeah, that was a – that was a – hey, what Cleve did, um, I hope never gets overlooked. No. To, to come in and to That's turn it. that thing around and, and get them back where um, – where we expected that we'd be in NCAA tournaments, that we expected we would compete for conference championships and all that again. It was a remarkable job. Well, he said it on the path, the people that he surrounded himself with. Right on. Dave Rose takes over the program. Heath Schroyer goes and is a very successful coach at two or three places. Uh, he's the one that opened the door for me to be part of the BYU uh, family administration. So... I just, we're, we all owe a great deal of, of uh, gratitude to Steve Cleveland. He's the one that kind of got that program going the right direction. Our yeah. Wise Guys Inspirational Quote of the Week. Let's roll out with yeah. that. We'll yeah. skip we're, birthdays we're go, and all that other stuff. We're going to go with Rocky Balboa, which, which seems fitting for tonight. Yeah, I think it is fitting for tonight. This is a Rocky Balboa quote. It's from the movie, but... but uh, since Sylvester Stallone wrote the movie, it's from Sylvester Stallone. Right? And, to, so. and to a lot of us, Rocky Balboa is a real person. That's right. So <laughs> That's exactly right. So he says, you, me, or nobody is going to get hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. That's how Rocky did it. That's how Brian Santiago did it. How Danny Ainge did it. And... Uh, that's one of the great quotes that covers so many different things but motivates you to keep going. Our inspirational quote of the week. Danny Ainge, Brian Santiago, we thank them for stopping night. by. It's great having Thanks you here. You're welcome anytime. Hey, thank you, guys. Nice to be with you. When that schedule comes out, we may have to have you back to break it down. Let's go. Let's go. We're ready. Next week, defensive coordinator Jay Hill and baseball head coach Trent Pratt ahead of their big fundraising event and the new season. Podcast will be up tomorrow. We encourage you to share it with everybody and plan to be with us next week. For Dave McCann, Blaine Fowler, Brian Santiago, that's it. We're done for the week. How See are we going to make week. it six more days before we'll the next show? See you next week. We can do it. We'll do it. See ya. <laughs>